The reading this morning is from 2 Corinthians, chapter 2, starting at verse 12, and it can be found on page 1160. 2 Corinthians, chapter 2, verse 12, continuing on into chapter 3. Now, when I went to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ and found that the door of the Lord had opened a door for me, I still had no peace of mind because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I said goodbye to them and went on to Macedonia. But thanks be to God, who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one, we are an aroma that brings death. To the other, an aroma that brings life. And who is equal to such a task? Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ, we speak before God with sincerity as those sent from God. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such confidence we have through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. This is the word of the Lord. I do hope that you're going to have that uh, page open of 2 Corinthians chapters 2 and 3 because that's what we're going to be looking at uh, this morning. So as we do that, shall we pray together? Heavenly Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that you will take this word, this part of this letter that Paul wrote by your spirit to the Corinthian church and that you will apply it to us today that we might love you more and serve you more effectively in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 15. We are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ amongst those who are being saved and those who are perishing. We are, writes Paul, an aroma. Hmm. Bit of an interesting word. In other words, what's the whiff? 
Maybe you weren't aware of being a whiff, an aroma. Yet Paul says that we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ. Now, there's all sorts of aromas, aren't there? Um, You know, they might be a fragrance with memories attached to it, a smell you enjoy, perhaps, or some you don't. And sometimes a picture alone doesn't give us sufficient information to discern the aroma. Is it pleasant or not? Is this a nice smell of cooking or is there something burning on the hob here? It's quite distinct, the notion of smell. So what is Paul actually talking about here in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 to 15? There are two different Greek words in these two verses that have been translated as aroma in the version that we have in the church, the Bible translation, the New International translation that we have in these church Bibles. And many other Bibles, um, many other translators render the word in, in verse 14 as fragrance. So he's talking here about a beautiful smell in this situation. And he's saying that there is fragrance that flows from Jesus, first of all to us, his people, and then secondly, on from us to those around us, who he refers to as the saved and the perishing. Now, all this imagery is a bit easier to understand if we know a bit more about the cultural context in which the Corinthians were living. And I hope you can see Corinth here, um, southeast of Rome, labelled blue. The point is that Corinth is a port strategically placed for trade routes in the first century. And the city went back a long way. Although it had been destroyed by the Romans in 146 BC, when they decided to rebel against Rome, a hundred years later, in 44 BC, it was re-established as a Roman colony when Julius Caesar decided to settle there. And uh, settle, what he did was to settle 3,000 slaves and army veterans there to start the city afresh. So the culture was really Roman and it was a wealthy and flourishing place. And it's because of this Roman link that Paul uses the image of a triumphal procession when he writes to the Christians there. Look again at verse 14. Thanks be to God who always leads us as captive in Christ's triumphal procession and uses us to spread the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. This relief from the time shows that his readers would have known exactly what this triumphal procession was all about. Here is the conquering victor, seated high, receiving all the glory as he returns home from some military campaign with captured foes all around. And Paul uses what is a familiar image to the Corinthians to say that there is another triumphal procession, a spiritual one, in which Jesus is the conquering hero and we, his followers, are part of his procession. Christ is the conquering hero. Because of the cross, he defeated all the powers of evil, rendering them impotent. And we are those who rejoice in his victory. And as we follow on after him, our lives are changed forever. This is what it says in the letter to the Colossians, using the New Living Translation. In Colossians 2, verse 13, God forgave all our sins. He cancelled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. He was victorious. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. The point is that by dying on the cross and rising again, Jesus won the greatest victory of all. And as we identify with him in his death and resurrection, we become one of his band, 
this procession who share in his victory. So we lift him high because we owe him everything. This slide shows the resurrection grave clothes flying as a banner around the cross. In the Roman victory procession, only those who were pardoned by grace, by the grace of the victor, were freed from death. And so it is with us. The grace of God imparts his victory to us, like a sweet-smelling aroma blowing over us. The sense of smell was very important in the ancient world. And in times of jubilant celebration, it was generally associated with the aroma of burning sacrifices. But unlike Roman sacrifices that were offered to worthless idols, in Paul's imagery, Jesus is our sacrifice, offered once for all to bring us to God. The fragrance of the grace of forgiveness the flowing of that grace that offers sins freely forgiven wafts over us in all its beauty with that fragrance of his sacrifice. So we may be triumphant, but our battles in life are not yet over. As Christians, we are followers of the God who's won the war but until Jesus comes again at the end of time as we know it, there will be challenges to come. The best analogy I think I've ever heard to help us understanding this is one based on World War II. You may well have heard it before, but I, I do think it doesn't it bears repeating really. That on D-Day in June 1944, as the Allies crossed the Channel to overcome enemy troops, Everyone knew that the Second World War was over. Once the Allies had occupied France, the Third Reich stood no chance of winning. This did not mean that the rest was plain sailing. There had been many more encounters on the battlefield and further casualties, but victory was assured. In the same way, because we know that Jesus defeated the powers of evil on the cross and has already won the war by rising from the dead, we do not have to be afraid of further spiritual battles to come as we wait for the day when all things will be completely and perfectly restored. With Gladiator 2 coming out sometime later this year, I hear, I recently rewatched the film Gladiator. Russell Crowe plays the part of Maximus, an unjustly imprisoned Roman general bent on restoring all that is good and, ro and right to a corrupt Roman state. And there's a point in the film where Maximus arrives at the heart of the Roman Empire as a slave. As the fortifications of the city of Rome rise up before him and his companions in all their CGI glory, the man standing next to Maximus is overwhelmed. I've never seen anything like this before, he gasps. I didn't know people could make this sort of place. And for us in life, there will be spiritual battles ahead that at a first sight can feel as overwhelming as the Roman army itself. Yet just as in this film, all that is good and just is bound to win the day, so too with us, it's assured. Paul tells us in his letters to the Ephesians in chapter six that spiritual battles are to be expected on our front lines. He talks about that we are pitted against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces in the heavenly realms. And yet we are on the winning side. We are part of the triumphal procession, remember, that has Jesus as our Lord and King. We receive the fragrance of his triumph as it spills over us so that we might spread the aroma of Jesus everywhere we go on our front lines. God uses us, it says in 2 Corinthians 2.14, to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him 
everywhere. Do we have any influence? Well, yes, we do, because we are the fragrance of Christ. And you'll certainly know it when you get a response or a reaction. Because whenever the fragrance of Jesus is around, it always has an influence. It's like this dried lavender, traditionally used in storage, whose fragrance permeates the atmosphere gradually and hangs on. Fragrance can set the tone. They say, don't they, if you want to sell your house quickly, that you should have fresh coffee uh, going when uh, buyers come to view or bread baking in the oven. And it's supposed to give a welcoming atmosphere. It will be noticed. In uh, 2007, when I was a curate, I had the opportunity to go with the church youth group to the Soul Survivor Summer Festival at Shepton Mallet. And I remember certain things about that week quite clearly, even though it's so long ago. The fact that it bucketed down with rain practically the whole time. The fact that the weather gave us the opportunity for some amazing discussions about Christian things with the young people, all stuck in our mini marquee with few other places to go. And I remember crawling around my tiny tent on the edge of our bit of field. But I especially remember the tent right next to mine, even though I never met any of the people in it. It belonged to another church youth group. They had a strong London accent and spoke the kind of language that you don't normally hear at church events. <laughs> so yet within three days of being there, the language I was hearing completely changed. Swearing and coarse words were replaced by kindness and good manners. It seemed that living on a campsite in a prevailing Christian atmosphere had a profound effect. My neighbours could not escape the fragrance of Christ that was permeating that place. Sometimes the message of Jesus that we stand for will elicit a positive response, as in that case. But there will also be negative reactions. As Paul says in chapter 2, verse 16, to the one we are an aroma that brings death, to the other an aroma that brings life. If you're living as a Christian, wherever you're called to be and to work, then it won't go unnoticed. Either way, though, you will, wherever you are, make a difference on your front line. All of us were made to make a difference. Even those who aren't yet Christians understand this. That's the reason why this film, It's a Wonderful Life, is America's favorite Christmas film. I wonder if you remember it, it's so good. James, I love James Stewart, you see. James Stewart plays ordinary man George Bailey, who believes he's made a mess of life. He's always playing the ordinary guy, uh, James Stewart, who believes he's made a mess of life and that his family and community will be better off without him. So he contemplates suicide. And as he does so, an angel appears and reveals to George what his family and his local community would look like if he'd never lived. Much to George's surprise, he finds that he's made a huge difference to the number of lives he's touched. That just through the small and seemingly little things that go to make up everyday life and shape our communities, he has played a significant part in bringing good to those around him. He decides that his life is worth living after all. Now imagine taking this principle on the wind of the Holy Spirit, bringing the aroma of Jesus into our local communities. That's the way in which Jesus walked. He never wrote a book, he never held high office, he never had a family or owned a home, he didn't go to college, he never lived in a big city, he never traveled 200 miles from the place where he was born. And yet, he changed the world. And he invites us, in the way that we live, to take up his mantle, to pass on his fragrance, and to make a difference where we are. 
Just like Jesus, we're called to live incarnational ministry on our front lines. That means we're, we're involved in this incarnational mission. That's what mission is about. It's about being there in the place. You know, the body, incarnate, inca the body, incarnational mission. It means being there. It means being Jesus to others, spreading the fragrance of Christ where we go. So where are you called to be? Spreading this fragrance of Christ. The office, the shop, the toddler club, the food bank, the lab, the kitchen, the sports field, the hospital, the garden, the school. I could go on and on. For John and Elise Fletcher, and their family, it's the slums of Bangkok in Thailand. They are literally urban neighbours of hope. And they visited us here last Sunday, and you can hear on the recording exactly what Elise said, because it's all about this incarnational mission. She said, our mission is very relational. It is a community development. It's spreading the hope of Jesus in the context of urban poverty. We have the privilege to follow Jesus to a place where our feet wouldn't naturally take us, left to our own devices. And he is there before us. Jesus is there first. We don't take him with us. He invites us to work with him. I'm going to uh, invite Helen May now to come up and uh, uh, tell us a little bit about her front line and... Uh, and just as she does that, it's the third Helen up here, by the way, today. Hope you noticed. Um, Helen, I hope that, I presume this is all geared up and switched on. I just want to, uh, uh, Joe was saying, what, what, does, you know, what happens when you wake up in the morning? Well, actually, this morning, God spoke to me when I woke up. And he said, you must talk, and this word came into this strap line that is much neglected of the Church of England. It's why I signed up to the Church of England in the first place, which is um, the Church of England is a Christian presence in every community. A Christian presence in every community. That's why we have the parish system. It's why um, we as a PCC at this church vote every year for a parish share that gives money to help not only to pay for our clergy, but for, to pay for clergy in churches where they haven't got enough sufficient funds to pay for a whole clergy, clergy stipend. And the money goes to poorer areas because of that and it goes to chaplaincies it goes to work in mission incarnational mission in prisons in the military in immigration centers in hospitals and it supports church of england schools and governors and it's incarnational mission a presence in every can be a Christian presence in every community. And Helen's going to tell us a little bit about this, though. A lot of the meetings that we go to at church are really, um, uh, you know, just really exciting, aren't they? I just love some church meetings. And we had a pastoral meeting on Monday where Helen shared this. She'd already shared it with her life group. And then if you'd like to come and uh, just, just move over a little bit and tell us what happens to you. Every, you're involved in hospital visiting. Is that right? And you go every week on the Thursday. Would you like to tell us a bit what happens? Um, okay. Um, so basically, um, I lost my husband um, in 2022. Can, can people hear? Sorry. Is it not? Are we not switched on here? <laughs> oh, thank you, Joe. Thank you very much. Right. So basically, um, I lost my husband in 2022 um, to cancer. And after 40 years of marriage, I found that suddenly I had time to dedicate my life to Christ. So I started asking God, where do you want me, Lord? You know, I was looking at everything. I was looking at CAP and all sorts of different places. But I had been in the NHS for 15 years, and God, I felt, was leading me back there. So I applied for an advert for vol volunteers for speaking to patients, and I thought, this is great because whilst I was in the NHS, I didn't have time to speak to patients. The pressure was so great. But I didn't expect the next thing, which was that he put me in this very small unit in Worcester. It's not the main hospital. Um, all I can say is it's grim, <laughs> okay? It's, um, 
predominantly a holding bay for elderly people who are post-op and rehabilitation is in place, or people who have had strokes, people with dementia, people who are ill and are no chance of recovery. So you can imagine there's quite a very sad atmosphere within there. And also there's an awful lot of upset and anger because these people don't know where they're going. Other people now are in charge of their lives. And suddenly all their decisions has been taken away. So we have quite a, a grim picture. But anyway, here's where Jesus Christ comes into it. So every day I go to this place, I always say to the Lord, Father, show me who you want me to speak to today. And <laughs> sure enough, the ones that really need Christ are the ones I'm led to. And um, I've had so many awesome times where I've just really stood back in amazement because the Holy Spirit has just used me to communicate with these people. And many is a time they'll be staring at my eyes. And I'm, it, it, it's not me, you know, it, they're staring at me, but they put their hand here and they look at me and they go, you know, you're so beautiful. And I know it's Christ they're seeing, it's not me. And there's this, just this general air where the Holy Spirit is reaching out to these people and it is the most amazing. And I feel very humbled and privileged that Christ has actually used me in this way. Um, I even have people with short-term memory loss, and they'll always remember me when I go back. They don't even have to look. They know by my voice is me. And they'll say, I recognize that person. So, and the other thing I did was um, I asked the Gideons if I could have some Bibles. And they've delivered a great big box of Bibles on the doorstep with their newspapers. And I've also bought magnifying glasses, which are plastic, because there's a lot of people with impaired vision. And I thought I could bring some joy back into their lives so they can read again. And one man in particular has asked for communion. And Helen very kindly has said, she'll come with me and administer the Eucharist for this man. So I just want to say that, you know, I'm nothing without the Holy Spirit. He does everything. And I don't even have the confidence to be up here today without the Holy Spirit. And I can tell you something else, he's got a really warped sense of humor because <laughs> I just wrote all my notes down. And for the first time in my life, I have got no glasses. <laughs> so <laughs> thanks for that, God. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helen, spreading the fragrance of Christ on your front line by the power of the Holy Spirit. Because actually we think, well, how, how, on earth, how on earth can I do this, spreading the fragrance of Christ? I'm just an ordinary person. And I'm encouraged that in uh, chapter 2, verse 16, Paul says just the same. Paul, he says, who is equal to such a task? Because the truth is that without the Holy Spirit... We're not going to be any good at any of this sort of stuff, living this incarnational life as Jesus did, being involved in incarnational mission on our front lines. Anything that we try to do by our own efforts is going to be doomed, in my experience, to disappointment and frustration. And Elise was so right last week when she said that we're invited to partner with Jesus, that we don't go alone. And it's about walking with Jesus in his triumphal procession into these places. Look at what Paul says in chapter 3. Not that we are competent, in verse 5, in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves. As Helen was saying, it's all about Christ doing it. Our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant. We have no competence other than what God gives us. And he gives it to us by his Holy Spirit. This is how chapter 3 verse 6 develops. God has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant. Not of the letter but of the spirit. For the letter kills but the spirit gives life. 
What he's saying here is that those who live by the rules, those who know the, the facts, those who know all about Christianity and think, oh, I'll live a good life, I can do this for myself, uh, just as a good Jew might do with the words written, the word of God written on the roll that you see there, the he Hebrew scriptures on a roll that, that they would have known in the first century. But that it's not about that, it's about internalizing these words into our hearts so that the life of the Holy Spirit empowers people to do what is right. And that's the only way in which our lives will be a witness, a letter, as he says in verse 3 of chapter 3, a testament to Jesus. Mission is impossible without the power of the Holy Spirit. There is no other way in which we can be Jesus to people. This is Christ's victory parade, not ours. Whatever our front line, we need time and time again to come back to God, to be filled afresh with the Spirit's empowering presence. And so today's passage ends with these words. Quite simply, the Spirit gives life. Don't you want that life? That life that enables us to live naturally supernatural lives in our own context, on our front line, wherever we are. To be someone who is allowing the fragrance of Christ to flow through us to a needy world. And we can have that today. All we have to do is to ask. God never turns away anyone who comes to him. And as Paul says in verse 4, our competence comes from God alone. I don't usually do this, but I, I'm going to invite you this morning, if you're able, to stand. And we're just going to spend time holding out our hands, ready to receive the Holy Spirit afresh this morning. And as Debbie plays the intro to our next song, we have an opportunity to be praying that prayer for ourselves that we might be filled with the Spirit, that we might be able, through Him, through the power of the Spirit, through Christ in us, to walk the life that He's called us to in His strength, rather than trying to do it on our own. And so we pray this morning, Lord, please fill us afresh. May all that we do be from the fragrance that comes from you. May there be nothing of ourselves. Lord God, we thank you that we are your foot soldiers. We are your people and that we walk with you in your victory train.